Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we have the pleasure of uh, Dr. Katerina Artruskova giving us a talk on curve fitting in XPS. Thank you, John. I'll welcome, everybody. Uh, before we start the webinar, I would like to highlight a recent series of XPS guides that came out in Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology. In the recent years, there has been acknowledged that in a lot of literature, there are a lot of um, inconsistencies and mistakes related to XPS analysis from the way we perform analysis to the way we, that we do data analysis. And that driven these series that are really excellent source of information from you. And one of the papers that I was um, working with a great um, team was the practical guides for curve feeding in XPS. And that is the basis for today's webinar. You can find lots of information in that guide that I'm not able to cover in uh, details as much as I would love to due to time limitation. So the outline we're going to look first is what is the, into uh, basis of XPS of photoelectric effect and chemical shift. We'll discuss what are the goals of curve feeding. In order for us to perform curve feeding um, adequately, we need to understand what are the physical processes behind generating a photo emission peak and what are the spectral features that contribute to the spectrum. And then the core of my presentation will be discussing some of the examples of common mistakes and approaches to avoid them. Something that probably all of us quite well understand is what are we doing in XPS. So we are using an X-ray of fixed energy and we're ejecting photoelectrons. If the energy of our X-ray is higher than the binding energy of the electrons, then the photoelectrons will be emitted with a specific kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is what we're measuring in order to find what is the binding energy of the electron. So this photoelectric effect is, of course, the balance of the energy. The total energy that we put in into the system by our X-ray is equal to the sum of the binding energy and, and kinetic energy and the work function of the instrument. What we are after in XPS is, of course, the binding energy. Binding energy tells us what is element that is present, but what's more important, it tells us what is the chemical state. So it's very sensitive to balance state, oxidation state, coordination of our element. And that, of course, is the power of XPS. But in order for us to use that information to extract it, there are a lot of um, data processing uh, tools that we need to use in order to identify different chemical states. So let's look at the chemical shift. What is the basis for, for, for chemical shift formation? So chemical shifts are small shifts in binding energy that depend on the chemical bonding. Generally, core, the core level of uh, binding energy increases as we withdraw electron density and therefore the positive uh, charge of the atom increases. So in simple approximation, it's electrostatic effect. So for example, here we show 3D iron to P orbital. So when we have our uh, metal, we have three electrons, but when we have uh, one of the electrons in the valence state participating in bonding with oxygen, we have um, decrease in the um, binding energy, you can see the shift and even though our core electron do not participate directly in the in the bond, due to electrostatic effect, all of the electrons now become strong, more strongly bonded to nuclei, and therefore binding energy increases. As as a rule, uh, the biggest shift is usually observed when we have participation between uh, two different um, neighbors that have largest electronegativity difference. So, for example, fluorine, which is the most electronegative element will produce largest shift when it's bonded to low electronegative elements such as carbon. So let's look at some of the examples of the magnitude of a, a chemical shift. So here we have a table on the left with um, elements, different metals and their oxides. And we can see that for there is a quite large range of uh, shifts due to different oxidation state. For top plus, two plus oxides, we have as small as two eV and as large as, for for example, for titanium as six eV. As I said, as a rule of thumb, we have a positive shift. But here, for example, for copper and for zinc, this shift is much smaller. Carbon is very rich in chemistry. You can imagine that carbon participates in organics and polymers in a variety of different chemical bonds formation. And here's an example of organic samples. What is the chemical binding energy when carbon is bonded to different environments? 
So with the power of XPS of having sensitivity to chemical shift, you can also see how challenging it is because different types of moieties can result in the same binding energy shift. It's our tasks as scientists to uh, identify this correctly based on full understanding of the structure that we have. So what is the goal of curfitting? So the goal of curfitting is to separate photo emission signal from distinct elemental and chemical states based on physical processes. And this is the key. We don't do curfitting just to fit mathematical number of components to represent uh, the best uh, mathematical fit. We're doing that to extract information based on physical processes. So here's an example of PET carbon 1S spectrum that I will show later as well. When you obtain the spectra, you see that we have multiple peaks that come from different types of chemical uh, moieties present in PET because they uh, change by the energy of carbon that associated with those moieties. So how do we interpret this? We interpret this based on parameters that we can extract from CORFIT. So the first parameter that we extract is binding energy. So we look at the binding energy all of all of these peaks. And based on reference data, we can identify what are the possible moieties that can appear at this binding energy. When we have a reference like that, it's quite easy to identify that, let's say, our biggest peak it comes from aromatic structure, um, and etc. The second piece of information that we can extract is the full width at half maximum. This is exactly what it is. At half in, of intensity of, of total intensity of our peak, we have the full width. And this parameter is important because it's a fitting parameter, but also it, it's an indicator of some of the chemical environments, as I will talk a little bit later about. But of course, we always um, would like to get quantitative information. We would like to relate these areas under the peaks to concentration of those moieties. And this is how we, we extract the third parameter. So we get, obtain relative areas of each component peak because they, they provide the concentration of different chemical states. And for a structure like that, uh, of course, what they, we would like to extract uh, these areas to the peaks, they have to correspond to stoichiometry of our sample. So how do we do that? So if you look at this a very base, basic fundamental process, we are feeding individual peaks to photo emission spectrum using mathematical algorithm that minimizes certain figure of merit, whether it's residual or chi-square, by measuring what is the closest of my mathematical reproduction of the spectra when we add all of these individual peaks together to the experimental data. And we do that in a ready fitting pattern, and, I mean, and it stops once we reach the minimum of our figure of merit. Coming back to the fact that we are not looking into best mathematical fit. So here's an example from xpslibrary.com of fitting oxygen 1S spectra. You can see that you can fit oxygen 1S spectra here in four different ways, and I'm more than sure that there are more ways that we can fit that. But what is the best way? The best way is the most physically meaningful uh, way where we relate our curve fit parameters, uh, models to the chemistry that contributes to experimental data. So therefore, the best fit is not always mathemat best mathematical fit. And that's the challenge of curve fitting. That's the challenge of identifying what is the most physically meaningful fit. But we have lots of information that helps us, which I, I, that I will discuss today. So let's first look at what are the speed features that contribute to the spectra. And uh, by no means I have time to go into each of these contributions, but in the guide, all, all of them are discussed. So of course, the main uh, contribution is what we try to extract. This is our chemical environments and that contribute by different, by maybe overlapping peaks. So for example, here we have tungsten 4F for tungsten oxide, and we have metal peaks and we have oxide peaks. So we have two chemical states that we know for this material. In addition to that, we can have S spin orbit splittings for all but S orbitals. So we have seven half and five half uh, splitting for both metal components and oxide components for 4F orbital. We can have multiplet splitting if we have unpaired electrons. We can have shake up features uh, that are usually present for aromatic structures or metal structures. 
We can have plasma lines, and they are often you may have seen them in aluminum to uh, P spectrum. Of course, we have background. The background is always present, and we usually remove it in order to get accurate area under the peak so we can get accurate concentration. So you see that it's very important part of our feeding of XPS spectra. And also we may have Auger transitions that contribute to the same region of interest that, or, that and or they overlap. So during curve feed, we need to identify all of these features and then separate them so we can accurately obtain quantitative information that is related to concentration of chemi different chemical moieties in our material. Before we start any graffiting, of course, it all comes back to the quality of the data that we, that we obtain. Of course, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, underestimate the calibration of the instrument that affects the quality of the data uh, along, across the intensity of the, to provide the best signal to noise and provide a binding energy linearity, etc. Something that is very important, as I uh, mentioned, this background subtraction. That affects your areas calculated and therefore concentration. If you have uh, samples for which you need to use charge neutralization, you need to be sure that your charge neutralization is effective and that you uh, perform your charge correction accurately because these two uh, factors will affect binding energy accuracy and therefore your identification of um, the chemical moiety. So in addition to that, let's look into what are the physical contribution into the shape of the XPS peak. You probably, if you have done XPS before and you have maybe experienced um, people who don't have a lot of experience with XPS spectra, they are very skeptical of looking at the XPS uh, curve fitting because you can put any number of peaks of any shape and get really good uh, chi-square. But we have lots of physical information about the way that spectrum is generated for us to back us up, so to speak. So first of all, is there is uncertainty principle that we, uh, gives us a Lorentzian energy distribution. But in addition to that, we have instrumental parameters uh, of spectrometer broadening, etc. That contributes by Gaussian shape. So therefore, overall shape of our photo emission peak is a convolution of Gaussian and Lorentzian. Voigt function is the best mathematical representation that describes the uh, nature of our intrinsic processes the best. But in reality, we usually, what we use in curfitting software nowadays is Gaussian-Lorentzian mix. It can be either product of Gaussian-Lorentzian or a sum of Gaussian-Lorentzian mixture. So here's uh, one way to look at this the Gaussian Lorentzian mix. So we have here example of when we have purely Gaussian um, spectrum. So when our Lorentzian contribution is zero, our mix will be equal to zero and we'll have 100% Gaussian contribution. However, when we have all, we have 0.99, almost 100% Lorentzian is when we have Gaussian contribution equal to zero. So we can see that it, it varies our shape quite a lot. That Gaussian Lorentzian killer character can be used as fixed or it can be fitting parameter in the model. When you don't know how to start with, how to start, of course, the reference elements and compounds provide really good input. And that is as a rule of thumb. You'll hear me talking throughout this webinar, references, 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 because it tells you a lot about uh, your instrument and the settings at which you acquire a spectrum. The general recommendation and understanding that compounds have um, a more Gaussian shape, so we recommend 0.1 or so um, for Gaussian Lorentzian mixture, while for um, for pure metal and elements, large it's more a Lorentzian contribution. But again, this is a general recommendation but you need to understand your own uh, uh, materials and your own instrument um, as much as possible in order to uh, use uh, good judgment for that parameter. The other contribution is in the, sh in the width of the peak. So I mentioned that we extract this full width at half maximum. There are several parameters that contribute to that. How wide are the peaks? The first one is related to the lifetime of the photoelectronic process. What we know that 
if the electron is in the deeper core level, such as, for example, 1s electron for aluminum, which is deeper than aluminum to P, and of course it has smaller uh, kinetic energy, it will have a wider width. So they have a longer lifetime, and therefore it's con the spread of your um, time contributes to the larger width of the peak. The second parameter is the, the width of the X-ray radiation. We have monochromators, but still our X-ray have certain widths to it. Below resolution of our X-ray widths, we cannot uh, get a more narrow uh, peaks in our spectra. So here's an example of the same reference, PET, obtained using aluminum source and chromium source on our CAHAXPIS instrument. And because chromium source has a nat natural width wider than aluminum, the full width half maximum for our carboxyl peak will be wider for, for chromium source than for aluminum source. Then we have properties of the spectrometer. When we acquire spectra, we have a choice of parameters and that affects resolution. So the lower the pass energy for the same radius of the analyzer, the higher the resolution. So that's another contribution in your widths of your peaks. And then there are also contributions that come from chemical environment. There are processes that may go on with many electrons interact during eject photo ejection that can affect the broadening of the peak. And normally metals therefore have much narrower full width half maximum than metal compounds. So out of all of these contributions, you can see that the full width half maximum will be affected by the natural lifetime, by photons widths, by analyzer settings, and specific to the element chemical state. So that's a physical uh, processes that you need to be aware of when you are choosing what is the full width half maximum. So let's look at this example of graffiti. So what are we we're going to be looking at example, a very simple example of PAT because we know what, what the structure is so we can easily uh, set up our model for graffiti. So we have our experimental line, carbon 1L spectrum and oxygen 1L spectrum. That line is our experimental curve. And if the model consists of background, so we always subtract background, and component peaks. So we start with individual peaks. And these individual peaks are added together to produce reproduced spectrum, which is a red line. And the difference between our experimental curve and red line, which is our reproduced mathematic reproduction of the spectrum, is a residual. So when we are graffitiing, we are trying to minimize our residual. So let me go back, go and uh, do a, a demo. So uh, we're going to be using multipack for this demo. Each software is different. So if you um, are have, uh, you are using other software, of course, uh, that there will be uh, a different experience, but the general approach is quite similar. So here we have carbon 1S for PAT. So we start with subtracting background, and we will talk about the fact of background later. So we have a subtracting background, as you can see, I'm including all of the features, I'm not uh, of my uh, carbon 1S spectrum. And then we need to use curve fitting. So we're gonna start from start from scratch. So we know that we have the biggest peak is carbon-carbon bond. So I put the first peak. As we can see now, what we see? We, have, we see our first spectrum peak that I added. And we see here the parameters that I mentioned before. So we have position of the peak, which is binding energy. The intensity is uh, comes later when we're trying to extract the areas. The full feed will have maximum. Um, Th that these are the main parameters and the Gaussian character. So in this case, the Gaussian character is at 90%. For, and then we have bend limits. So the constraint that allows us then the model to try to fit our, our peaks within certain range. So we can see that our position is constrained to plus minus 0.15. Our width is constrained to plus minus 0.1. And we have also the limited range of our Gaussian characters. So we are constraining them, and software allows you to choose what are the limits to use when we're doing the fit. So we know that the main peak is again is to our aromatic structure. So the second is our peak of that is our secondary carb bonded carbon. So the carbons that are bonded to carbon, they bonded to oxygen. The third peak is our 
carbon single bonded to oxygen. The fourth peak is our carboxyl, I'll just label it carbon O, and we have shake up. So the shake up that is due to pi pi attraction, we do not ignore that. That is a part of our model. So we can see that now we have um, multiple peaks, and then in red line is a re mathematical reproduction. So all of these peaks that I've added, they added together, and we have the red curve. And we have a residual that shows the difference between experimental shape and uh, mathematical reproduction. And when I click fit, our algorithm behind the scene does iterative fitting to minimize the, the um, error. And we now see really nice fit. Really, uh, our residual looks like noise. This is what we are uh, uh, trying to achieve. And then we can look at um, variety of the output. So the output, let's say we're gonna look at the summary table. Um, and I hope that you, you see it well on your screen. So here's the summary table. It will tell us what is the position the separation between them. What is the width, full width, half maximum? The intensity from which we calculate, of course, the, the, the area, the, the calcium character. So all of this and chi squared. So all of these parameters are important for you um, in interpreting and identifying the chemistry, extracting concentration, etc. And for reporting purposes, as we'll talk about later. So let's go back to our presentation. Let me just click. Okay. So this was our study, and this is our end. So at the end, when we fitted our spectra, we have our carbon 1S fitted and oxygen 1S fitted. You can imagine that depending on how you start your fit, what is your starting selection of peaks, number, position, weights, et cetera, you may end up in a different model, in a different local minima, let's, uh, as we call it. So we have to really be careful and monitor, use other criteria, not just chi-squared, to um, judge the uh, uh, your quality of your curve fit. Of course, you need to monitor the quality of the data that you obtain, as I showed you before, you try to look at the residual shape, etc. If you have similar data from similar compounds, references again, you can use that information. Um, as we will look at to spin orbit coupling, that splitting that you that may be a part of your features of the spectral features have to be taken into account. And in this case, a beautiful example, because it's, of course it's our reference of that, your accuracy of peak areas with respect to chemical moiety. So if you suspect a certain moiety that is present in your sample, you have to identify that peak in all of the participants. So let's say you have emit, you have to identify your emit bond in carbon spectra, in nitrogen spectra, in oxygen spectra. And area that, of that peak in, uh, that you convert to concentration have to be really well matched, so to speak. So here in this example for PET, our single bonded oxygen concentration that extracted from oxygen spectrum is supported really well to that from the uh, carbon with that spectrum. And this is really important to um, not forget about this very uh, con confirmation um, step of your core fittings. So now, after I've showed you very simple curve fit for reference spectra, let's look at some of the common mistakes. So the first mistake has to do with the quality of the data. Curve fitting spectra that have low signal to noise does not pro uh, provide enough justification to perform the curve fit. You have to have a high, a high, high signal to noise and energy resolution high enough in, in order to separate um, your spectrum into meaningful uh, components that are assigned to chemical moieties. So uh, when you have some, some elements that present a so really low detection limit, maybe curve fitting is not a way to process your data. If you have uh, uh, your elements that are present in high amounts, then be sure to, to acquire the data long enough to have high signal to noise ratio to to, so that you have enough uh, information to perform curve fit. Sometimes we, when we set up your, our experiment, we may make a mistake or we, over, we overlook things. But when we have too narrow spectra, uh, forgetting to include shakeups, satellites, spin orbit components, it makes, makes it difficult to apply appropriate background. And that will, of course, affect areas. 
So here's just an example that nitrogen 1S spectrum is cut off a little, so we're not adequately describing it. Maybe it's a small effect, but you need to include all of these components that, that um, contribute to your spectral shapes in order to uh, perform curve fit. Background. That is one of the most important st first steps that can change area under the peak. And of course, that will change the, the concentrations of chemical different components. So here's an example where the straight line has been drawn. And so we are not using some significant part of the spectrum in deriving the areas under these two peaks. Background selection is um, based on physical properties as we understand that electrons are getting a lot losing energy and they are contributing to our spectrum. So the best way to draw background and we'll look into what types of background uh, exist is to connect the spectrum to the noise level surrounding and the points where you select it should be somewhere in the middle of the noise. Then you would uh, be sure that you are doing, uh, including all of this for, uh, the signal that comes from the electrons of interest. There are two ways that background can be treated. The first way is probably the most common way, when we first remove it from the spectrum and then we curve fit it. Of course, that uh, requires a change in the original spectral data. So we remove the, the bottom, so to speak, part of the spectrum, and then we perform curve fit and extract areas under each individual peak. More sophisticated and more accurate approach is called active approach. In this case, the data are uh, unaltered and our background parameters are actually part of the curve fitting parameters. So they also fit it at the same time as you fit in your um, um, spectra. Most of the commercial software have uh, the first way to do um, a background correction. In terms of what background method exists, um, linear method is um, the most simple way where you just have inter uh, slope and intercept it's, but it's the least effective background. It can cause a substantial error. It works maybe quite well for very simple 1S orbital spectra where not a lot of uh, structure exists in the spectra, but it's uh, not well re recommended. Shirley background is probably the most common nonlinear background that works really well in iterative form. And this is probably the most, uh, you will see that this is a majority of your papers that you find in literature will report this Shirley background. Another background that you can apply is Tugert. It's not linear background. It's uh, it, it, this approach seems to work less effectively when we're feeding much more narrow peaks. Uh, usually, a Tugert background includes usually up to 30 eV uh, range from your main core level peak. But when we're doing curve fit, we usually focus on more narrow range. So it's not as effective, but in, in many cases, it's a, a relevant uh, background to be used. The next quite common mistake that you may find in the literature is using peaks of varying widths without any justification. There are instances when you need to use different widths for your peaks. For metal, it's more narrow for oxide. But here's an example for organic compound nitrogen 1 and spectrum where there was some process that's going on as a part treatment and we see that the first peak that was fixed at some um, widths was not probably constrained and now at the other temperature it almost twice as large and it's opposite for the second one very large wide peak becomes very small but remember we're using these peaks to extract quantitative information we are using areas under these peaks uh, to trace down the chemical process for example so that, of course, when you are not using consistent full width half maximums, that will affect your component percentage. So the recommendations, of course, is to understand what are the experimental and fundamental parameters, as we've discussed before, pass energy, natural lifetime, using references, finding the references that are suitable um, to understand what full, full, full width half maximum to use, finding literature with the reported for the same for similar compounds. And when you understand that, then using constraints. I showed you in PAT curve fit the constraint that I've used plus minus 0.1. So, or 10% of my full width half maximum. So again, how do we know what is the right full width half maximum? 
run your specs. If you have conductive samples, you can do it without charge neutralization. If you have, if you need to use charge neutralization, run your uh, PET at various pass energies so you understand what is the fundamental limit. And then, of course, the best way to do that is to do uh, use your relevant materials, whether you have a precursors that have a unique chemistry that you can use and using constraints. And you can actually learn quite a lot from, um, from your um, spectra by looking at your most right part of your spectrum. So at this right side of the spectrum, this is we have our highest kinetic energy or lowest binding energy. So at this point of, of the spectrum, you have the most pure chemical chemistry contribution. So the, 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 there are single chemical contribution at this energy, and you have smallest contribution from electrons that lost energy, so contribution of background. So you can, if you use too narrow peak to feed that side of the peak, you can, you can see that you're underfeeding. If you're using too wide peak, you're overfeeding. So you can use this as matching your slope of your most the high kinetic, highest kinetic energy range of your spectrum to find what is the most useful um, full width half maximum for that particular acquisition. Split orbit splitting. Probably in the literature, we see that this is one of the most uh, challenging um, topics, even though there's so much information available. So here's an example where in calcium 2P, you have three half and one half components, but the only three half component was used to use background correction and feeding. There are lots of information that we know about uh, spin orbit splitting. And you can use that information to constrain the area, the position for your doublets um, and differences in full wet half maximum. So let me show a few, so, so that, like I have a few examples. So we know that spin orbit splitting occurs for all orbitals except for S. So we can see here, for example, for iron 2 p you have three half and one half. The intensity ratio between different components is driven by given by multiplicity rules, and we know that it's we it's fixed. It may vary a little bit for different compounds, but all of that ex information exists in databases. The other value that we know, the features that we know, is the spacing for each. We have tabulated data of spacing between three half and one half, for example, for iron two p. For some of the um, the widths of the peaks may be more narrow for higher uh, component than for lower energy component. So that's, that's something that also reported in literature. And we can use this all information as a part of our fitting. We can fix positions and intensity of our lower intensity, lower intensity peak with respect to higher. So we can accurately perform curve fit. So for example, for sulfur 2P, we have information that Sulfur 2P has a closely spin orbit components, the separation between them 1.16. We know with the ratio of, in, of peaks to each other. And we know that if the or spin orbit splitting affected for all both uh, sulfur elements and compounds. So we can, should fit with doublets, sulfur 2P spectrum using the area constraints and separation constraints. For silicon 2P on the other hand, it's a smaller separation, and we have information that normally we need to take into account um, spin orbit component splitting only for metal, while it can be ignored for compounds. Let me show, uh, go back to my multi pack, and I'm going to open silicon 2P um, for ox. Sorry, I'm open the wrong one. I'm going to open silicon 2P. So here we have silicon 2P spectrum for oxide. So immediately you see a lower binding energy metallic silicon and higher binding energy is our oxide. So let's click fit. So let's start from scratch. So I put the peak in. Multipack is really great at guessing actually what is the widths uh, to be used based on that right shoulder of our spectra, trying to fit it as good as possible. And immediately we see that doublet suggestion. So that data database contains all of the information necessary for us to do proper curve fit. So I click double and we can see now that for, let's call it silicon metal, let's say, for example. And we can see that we have area lock at 0.5. So the intensity of our one half component is fixed 
with respect to intensity of three half be half of that. And also we have separation that is also provided in a database. And then we can add another peak where we uh, can increase and just use one peak for our arc side. We don't need to do any um, double because the, the database information suggests that and that is the most useful information. And then we can fit and we can also um, look at, as I showed before, what is the our summary table and look at the summary of all the information that is necessary for us to report and to extract quantitative areas for oxide versus metal. The other example that I already opened that I would like to share with you is that actually often that spin orbit splitting can be very useful when you have overlap between your, your peaks. So what I have here is an example of antimony. So antimony has overlap with oxygen. So oxygen appears approximately between 526 and 532. So we can see that oxygen would contribute to the three half, five half component of our antimony spectrum right here. But it doesn't contribute to three half component. So if we fix intensity of these peaks it between each other by separate by fixed and separation and intensity ratio, we will be able to separate oxygen contribution. So as shown in this example, when we uh, constrain intensity of our metal peaks with each other, they are perfectly fitted. But for oxide, uh, the intensity of three half component limits the intensity of the five half component. So we have really high residual in the area where oxygen is present. So that is where we can add oxygen 1s peak to complete the curve fit. And that will allow us to separate the concentration of oxygen from concentration of metallic antimony and oxide of antimony. There are many examples when you can take advantage of your spin orbit splitting in order to interpret your um, data correctly. The line shapes. We've talked about the, the line shapes that are Gaussian Lorentzian, but it's also something that we haven't talked about. It's a symmetry. The choice of the line shape affects, again, areas under the curve. And that depends on material that is being analyzed. And in databases, we have that information. So we know that for metal, it should be a symmetric shape. And we know that for uh, graphene, it should be also, a, uh, for, for aromatic structure, it should have a symmetric character. If we ignore that asymmetric character and fit our tungsten 4F, we have multiple peaks that are assigned at the same part of the spectrum as um, you as you would see just metal present, but we have actually four chemical states. So if that would be a right way to feed the spectra, you would extract information that you have four different state chemical states of tungsten at particular concentrations. For carbon, we'll say, this is graphene sheet, we have less than 3% of oxygen present. When we perform graphene using symmetrical peaks, we have an extract the percent area. We see that actually, we have 67 from aromatic and then shake-ups that come also, come, come also from our aromatic structure. But almost 30% of other carbons that we identify here come from carbon-oxygen bond. But it's not supported by oxygen having been smaller than 3%. So definitely something is, is not working out here. And that's because we have ignored the symmetry. The right way to feed this is to include a symmetry for your metal. And you can see that we have two chemical states. One is metal for tungsten, one is oxide. And for graphene, the same. We, we need to use a symmetric shape of towards the high embedding energy range where we can fix what is the this, uh, parameters of, um, of a symmetry and use it uh, in our curve feeding. And then add maybe some peaks that may be present to the oxygen that we also detect. So you see that it's uh, really important for you to include the symmetry into this um, curve feeding as well. And the thing, I think this is a um, very different approach to curve feeding the spectrum, but that may be very, very important when you're working with transition metals. So this approach is based on multiple papers suggested by Bessinger and xpsfeeding.com has all of this information. So in, it, this approach is, assumes on empirical feeding parameters for your reference compounds. So we can see here cobalt references that have been fitted by multiple peaks, and then all of them are actually constrained with respect to each other. So here's, for example, for nickel to P table, you have a position of your peak, you have full width half maximum that used a different energy 
you have the second peak separation from the first peak, the percent areas. You have a lot, all of these parameters can be a part of your model, really tightly constrained model. So you're creating this synthetic envelope by, uh, but, but of course what you need to remember is this is presented for a particular instrument, for a particular reference compounds. So in order to be uh, really careful, you need to run your own references um, for metals, for oxides, etc., and then fit them with approach like that, constrain your peak model very, very tightly, fix all of the areas with respect to each other, positions, etc., and then you can use that to um, work on, let's say, real samples that may have a mixture of your oxides, hydroxides, metals, etc. And some something at the end, uh, the last point that I uh, would like to discuss in terms of uh, mistakes is actually reporting. Um, as recommendations, uh, we always say that go find the literature, uh, find the XPS spectra for your compounds that are relevant. But often you find that the data that are reported in the literature do not have all of the information for you to judge the quality of curve fit. You need to include your original spectra. So here's an example when the original spectra were not included. You need to include your mathematical reproduction. So here we have only experimental, but not some of the other two components. No residuals are shown here. So in order for us as scientists to, to judge the um, quality of the curve fit, we need to see all of the components of the model and the table that associates with what are the parameters, Gaussian, Lorentzian character, what background was used, what full half maximum was used, et cetera. So that information is critical because that way we are propagating correct, adequate way to, to curve fit materials and we can rely on reproducibility uh, across the, the, the field. Um, so kind of summary slide showing what exactly you would expect for a proper curve fit and I, I covered uh, almost of all of these. You, you need to provide how you charge corrected. You need to include appropriate background, show the original data, not smoothed, include your mathematical reproduction and residual. Um, don't forget to include all of these spectral features that we've discussed, to use reasonable number of components with a reasonable shape that is driven by your settings of your instrument. Um, and something to remember that you can, the quality of the data are primary and then your interpretation of, that drives you the quality of their interpretation. And in appendix or supporting information, provide all of the values so that other scientists can reproduce that information and use it. Coming back again to, there's a lot of information in the XPS curve fitting guide, so please um, refer to that. And also there are lots and lots of helpful resources. Of course, we have our handbook. Uh, so we have um, some of the uh, spectra that, sh that for each of them, we have other elemental compounds that we used with separation between them and some of the chemical shifts. Um, XPS Simplified and XPS Feeding is a great resource for really challenging materials. They go into so much details for titanium, for example, they will look at the separation between different components and they may be different for different compounds. They will discuss what are the areas that include for your plasmas, for your shakes, shake up. So you can use that information to interpret your own data and that's a very um, valuable resource. And of course, uh, data from similar materials that are published in papers. And you will be surprised in the survey that was done, the majority of mistakes were done actually in high ranking journals where the study has been published, for example, for some really nice, you know, cool application of material. And they used a lot variety of analytical techniques. And because it's possible as a, to find reviews for each of the, that specializes in each of the analytical technique, sometimes mistakes happen and they crack through the system and you see those mistakes in the literature. Well, not as high ranking journals that are focused on high quality data for surface analysis, such as surface interface analysis, GVST, surface science spectra that has actual electronic e spectra database available, a journal of electron spectroscopy and related phenomena. There are others that I didn't list here. That the, this is the great resources to find what is the appropriate um, way to fit your data. And my final slide is um, 
we have lots of information for our members on using the multi-pack for curve feeding and smart software data acquisition. So please um, check that member area. We post all of our content on LinkedIn and webinars like I uh, became in today on YouTube and something to put on your calendar. We are planning right now our five user meeting. It will be it will be online in September. Uh, that will include on a, our usual format for um, updates from us as a company, updates from our customers, but we also will have tutorials, training from data processing and multi-pack for uh, and all the tough sims for all of our techniques. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Katerina, for an excellent talk. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in, um, and so we'll get going right away here. First question is, in the peak fitting process, shall we constrain the full width half max of all the components to be the same, or should they vary? Uh, so that's an excellent question. Um, and if if you work for a, for a compound, the which material that has a mixture of com of compounds, so let's say it has contribution from some metals and oxide and hydroxide, then you may need to use different full width half maximum. And then resources such as showed on XPS feeding or XPS simplified would have that information or run in your reference oxide spectrum and metal spectrum from exactly the same pass energy and trying to figure out what is the widths for your pure co uh, uh, contributions. But if you work with this for within the co this compound, let's say it's organic compound for which you work with sulfur, I wouldn't expect why it would have a different full width half maximum. I would constrain them the same to the same range of variability. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question for the iron 2P spectrum shown, how do you deal with the asymmetry of the peak in the curve fit? Uh, so if that's a, an iron, iron 2P uh, spectrum that is acquired from um, the surface, usually we have oxidation that is present, oxide. So definitely it's hard to interpret what is a symmetry to use and what are the contributions from oxides. So the best way again for your own um, instrument at your the fixed uh, settings that you would run your actual spectra is to sputter through, to remove all of the oxides, to, to reach the steady state, so to speak, where you think that you only have iron and develop a model to see what is the tailing properties that you need to use the weights and then use that to fit your um, surface data. Okay, excellent. Uh, the next question, in a system where you have just carbon and oxygen atoms, for example, uh, functionalization of carbon nanotubes, should I have the same number of components in fitting the carbon 1S and oxygen 1S spectra? Not necessarily. It depends again on chemical um, shifts that is produced by those chemical components. So you have, you have there's an ex ex excellent handbook of polymers that has a table for oxygen 1S chemical shifts and carbon 1S chemical shifts. So you can, uh, first you do the curve fit at, of carbon 1S using reasonable weights, you do the fit of oxygen 1S, and then you tr put together identification for each of them and try to, pass, to put this as a puzzle. You need to uh, find the same moieties in oxygen 1S that you find in carbon 1S spectrum. And um, there may be that for the same moiety in carbon, it will be multiple peaks uh, that are associated carbon oxygen bond to say single and double, but four oxygens will be the same peak. So it, it depends. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, how much structure do you tolerate in the residual spectrum? I guess that's kind of a difficult question to answer. It but... is a very difficult question. <laughs> it depends on signal to noise, of course, if you have, and you know, usually we also, we don't recommend smoothing your spectra. So if you smooth your spectra, then your residual will look really beautiful and like, almost no structure. Um, so I think it's uh, the structure, if it looks like up and down, up and down, up and down, right? <laughs> Within the certain signal to noise that is also supported by your noise level in the spectra, 
because you have you always have a background the, the part of the spectrum where you don't have peak you can always look at what is the noise structure there so the, your residuals should be similar to the noise structure in your data uh, so you will have when you acquire carbon on a spectrum you always have a little bit of, on both sides so you can compare that uh, to fluctuation in intensity to your residual but it is challenging Okay, thank you. Is it possible to use the RSF values in multipack software with the area fitted uh, with another software? Oh, so I guess they're using a different software package to fit the um, the peaks, but then want to use multipack to quantify the amounts of each. Hmm. hmm. That, I mean, I think each manufacturer has different parameters, set of parameters that go into um, calculations. So for, mul for, for multi-pack, for example, we have our um, RSF values, but then we need to correct them for transmission function and for asymmetry and other uh, that may not be the way that other manufacturers do that. So you have to be careful uh, to by converting uh, data from one format to another. But if you take that into account uh, and understand what you're doing, it's up to you <laughs> to be diligent about uh, that. And a related question on RSFs, can you use those RSFs to, to separate out the different components in a single peak or single yes. element? Yes, so there are multiple ways to do that. I didn't show that, but you can definitely, the way that I showed in antimony fitting, um, that you can uh, change the, the transition name for that peak to oxygen 1S and then multipack will know to use oxygen 1S RSF. Okay, thank you. Um, a background question here. Could you please clarify more about the difference of different backgrounds that are available? Um, so uh, there are several backgrounds that, uh, again, it depends very much so on the software package. Um, the most common ones that you see in literature, the linear background, um, the the one that we the, quite often use for polymers, oxygen 1S, carbon 1S, that may be quite effective for polymers. For other elements, for majority of metals, which are probably all other <laughs> elements, surely background or iterated surely just the way that it's uh, doing the prop process of calculating background are the very commonly used, uh, the most probably common. And then uh, Tucker background is usually worked for, like I said, for much larger energy window of your spectra. Uh, so then when you use Tucker background, you need to fit also the background part. So it becomes more challenging how to interpret the data. So for um, probably 99% of our data, we use Shirley or background uh, because it, it describes all of the, most of the orbitals quite well the best way, I would say. All right, uh, thank you. Next question, when calculating concentrations, do we include the shakeup or plasma in the concentration for that element? That's a very challenging <laughs> question. Um, so there has been actually some nice work done by, uh, that was presented by Dick Brundle and Chris Wins, where they showed the effect of ex not including of the satellites and shakes ups in quantification for a simple compound as lithium fluoride. Um, it is very important to be consistent and to include that information. It also goes back to how the, to also the relative sensitivity factors they, uh, they designed when they calculated uh, they are taking over a certain range and include the, the, that information is important. So definitely you need to include that information in your overall because those electrons are related to all of the electrons that came out from your material. All right. Um, about multipack, is there a good way of exporting the fitting in ASCII format to be plotted in Orange Lab or, or some other program? Yes, definitely you can export and it will all the residuals, individual peaks, uh, mathematical reproduction, experimental, everything will be saved as, as Excel file. Okay, thank you. Um, 
is there an option in Multipack to selectively assign individual peaks as asymmetric or symmetric? Yes, uh, if you have a second, actually, I'd skip that. But um, and so I have an example here. Uh, so we have um, tungsten example that I showed before. So again, starting with background subtraction. Um, so we have a choice of, you can so delete all. So we have a choice of asymmetric backgrounds, oh, sorry, shapes. Um, so we can we can um, select uh, asymmetric for one, but then for the other one, for the set for our oxide, we can uh, just go into bend limits and we can fix them to be zero. So I think that's not that strong. So and and uh, so it's that that will not be used as a fitting parameter. It will be fixed um, as a as, as symmetric, and then you can. Um, mix it, uh, use a combination of asymmetry and symmetry based on your understanding of the chemistry. So definitely. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, how much spin orbit splitting values, uh, for example, the energy gap and the area ratio vary in XPS peaks in real samples? Hmm. Well, as I think that's one of the the examples that I had before here, for example, for titanium. Um, so the the metal has 6.1, the nitrate 6, the oxide 5.7. So it's enough variability that you're trying to feed and it just doesn't work if you use 6.1 for, let's say, for all of them. Uh, but it's very de material dependence. And that's why if you don't use the information that is already available from references, you may you may think that you're doing something wrong, but it's not because there, there may be variability that you, you're not taking into account. Okay. And our last question here that we have time for today is how do you find the SP2 and SP3 content of something like graphite? And how do you make sure it's correct? <laughs> um, so, for, for car, car, from carbon alone is actually quite difficult to do that. Of course, you can have, uh, you can just buy pure graphite and you can buy diamond or just take, take your ring and, and analyze it. Um, and you, you run your, um, so to speak, references from exactly the same past energies, et cetera, and, and, and understand what is the asymmetry, what is the pull bit half maximum position of the peak and fix that. Um, and use that as your um, feeding parameters for then the unknown sample. Another part that it's it's also useful is look at our carbon uh, So the uh, the D parameter for carbon is actually really sensitive to sp2 sp3 character that doesn't require car feeding. It's just looking at the spacing bit of your second derivative, uh, low and high, uh, maximum and minimum of your Auger structure. But running references of, and they are readily available, graphene, graphene sheets would, would be a great example of SP pure SP2, and some kind of uh, HOPG would be a great example of. So there's a variety of references you can find. We would like to thank you all again for attending our, our webinar today uh, and look forward to uh, the next webinar coming up. And uh, remember to go to our website for any information that you need. <laughs>